What's up guys, it's DDP, back to talk a little bit more Mavericks basketball with you. And today, we're going to be tackling eight options for the Dallas Mavericks at the center position, a area of significant need for the Mavericks that was not addressed during the draft and that they will have to address starting July 1st, most likely when free agency opens. All that's coming up after the bumper. Now, if you were like me, you were probably pretty happy with the Mavericks Hall in the NBA draft. I know that there are still some people who don't know a whole lot about Luka Doncic's game and therefore are very skeptical, some outright throwing fits over the pick. But for all intents and purposes, by all indications, those who actually pay attention to European basketball, the Mavericks got who many consider the number one player on the board, not just at the time, but even entering the draft. Then, in round two, the Mavericks did another surprising thing, although this one I really understand. Instead of addressing the center position then, they instead take Jalen Brunson out of Villanova. Now, if you're not familiar with Jalen Brunson, just know this. He is a big point guard who won back-to-back -back titles with Villanova, was the player of the year last year, and was ridiculously efficient. His idol growing up? Steve Nash. Hence why he's wearing number 13 for the Mavericks. This kid, he might be a reserve player with you, especially when you already got Dennis Smith last year as your starting point guard, but I'm telling you, he's going to be a fine backup point guard for some time. Now what this did was this left a void for the Mavericks in the front court. And to address that, they're going to have to look at free agency. Thus, we have eight options for the Mavericks at center. Without further ado, let's get going. Now I'm gonna start this off in a pretty straightforward manner. This guy will not excite many people, but he is still an outside dark horse possibility. That guy is none other than Nerlens Noel. Now, for those wondering, Nerlens Noel appeared in just 30 games last year, seeing only six starts over the course of the entire season and seeing less than 16 minutes a night. Nerlens Noel, it's been well documented. The dude banked on himself after turning down a five year, $70 million contract offered by the Mavs last summer, only to get the stiff arm in free agency from literally everyone else. As such, he took a qualifying offer from the Mavericks that didn't even pay him starter money for a qualifying offer and as a result was forced to bank on himself for the season. How did that go? Well, we got hot dog gate, a broken wrist, and just baffling, baffling, did not play coach's decisions. So let's take a look at Nerland's stats. 52.4% from the field, 75% free throw shooter, 5.6 rebounds a game, 4.4 points, and 0.7 blocks a night. Now for Nerland's, He's better than those numbers. We know he is. We got a glimpse of him after the Mavericks acquired him at the deadline the previous year. And we know if you give him standard minutes, he can be productive for you. Now, the problem with Noel is that his advisors, first of all, told him to turn down $70 million when the NBA is moving faster and faster away from his style of play. He should have jumped on that money. He is a rebounder, he is a dunker, and he is a shot blocker. That is all he is. He is not a stretch four or five. He's not a guy that's going to do a whole lot for you. And the problem he got into last year is even before he started having his baffling did not play coach's decisions or his wrist injury or the whole eating the hot dog thing before a game because he knows he's not going to play, you still had several occurrences where Nerlens, deciding that he needed to pad his stats as much as possible, would instead go out of his way to headhunt on defense. And what I mean by that is he chased the block as opposed to sticking to his defensive assignment. That will infuriate any coach, but a coach like Rick Carlisle really has no patience for that. And that's why you started seeing Nerlens riding the bench night in and night out, and then eventually the wrist injury was announced and Nerlens took time off 
And that's how you only got 30 games out of Nerlens. This would obviously be the most disappointing option for the Mavericks if this is all they return at center. I don't know what the contract looks like to get him. At this point, his value is not very high, but can you really get anything of note out of the guy after everything you guys have been through the last year? I don't think so. I think it's best to move on. All the same, he warranted mentioning. There's no doubt Nerlens Noel completely mishandled his restricted free agency last year. Assuming that he could get a better offer from someone else that the Mavericks would be forced to match or to let him walk away. Again, the guy turned down five years and $70 million from the Mavericks. Who does that? He fired his agent in the middle of the process and then the new agent got nothing. No one offered him anything of note and so he took the Mavericks mid-level exception offer, again, not even getting starter money for that mid-level exception and it backfired spectacularly. I don't know what Nerlens is going to do, but odds are he's looking at a bench role moving forward because he's gonna have to work for a year or two to possibly elevate his perceived value because right now it's pretty low. The only thing he's got going for him is he's still really young and athletic. Number two, this for many, would be a dream scenario for the Mavericks. Me personally, however, it's not. I really don't think this guy is the best alternative for the Mavericks to fit what they do and to move them forward in this rebuild. Now, the Mavericks have made clear their intention is not to be in the lottery again. They've already said basically, hey, if we end up keeping that pick we gave for Luka Doncic next year, we view it as a failure of this season. That's big words and clear indication that the team wants to be back in the playoffs. And if that's the case, this guy does help them move in that direction. But the biggest needs the Mavericks have are rebounding and rim protection. This guy offers those, but he doesn't necessarily fit the profile of what the Mavericks need most. That guy is DeMarcus Cousins. Now, if you look at Boogie's stat line, 48 games last year, all 48 were starts, before he suffered a season-ending Achilles tear. Now, here's the thing. He suffered that late in the year. If you're getting DeMarcus Cousins, there's no way you're locking him down on a four- or five-year deal. He's 27 years old. Odds are, if he did leave New Orleans, his mentality would be to short term go somewhere to reestablish his value, prove that he was healthy and could get the full max wherever or to go to a contender. If he even considered Dallas, it would probably be a one or two year deal. And if that's the case, we're not looking at seeing him back on the court playing until at least December. Then you're talking two to three months of him just revving back up and getting back his legs under him. That, that was pretty much all of year one for Wes Matthews as a Maverick. Now, he's been a little bit better the past couple of years, but year one was pretty rough for him early going, and DeMarcus Cousins is going to have the same thing. So if you got him on a one-year deal, do you really want to get maybe a month, two at best, of good production out of him? Can you even compete and do something with him if that's the case? I don't think so. And beyond that, you're talking about a guy who has a reputation as a coach killer and as a locker room cancer. Don't forget, one of his best friends is Rajon Rondo. And it's not apples to apples. You can't automatically say, well, because Rajon butted heads with Rick Carlisle and was a diva, that Boogie would necessarily be. I would argue they're not entirely different in terms of that personality thing. But I don't know. I just don't think it's a fit for DeMarcus to come here. Coming off of the injury he's coming off of, he spent years and years with Sacramento going nowhere, but then got injured this year before he could even get to the playoffs. He still never played in the playoffs. Does that sound like someone who wants to come to a rebuilding team? Don't get me wrong. The guy is an elite center in this league. Not only is he a solid rebounder. Let's look at, let's look at the stats. 36 minutes a night, I already mentioned 48 games, 48 starts, 47% from the field, 35% from beyond the arc, 
75% free throw shooter. I'm slightly rounding up. 12.9 rebounds a game, 25 points a game, and 1.6 blocks a game. Again, that's with Anthony Davis. That is incredible production. And again, he's a stretch five. He can move out to the three-point line and shoot it as well as most guards in the league, most of your three-point shooters in the league. It's incredibly impressive what he's able to do. But the reason is, I think given his career situation, his injury, and where the Mavericks are in regards to competing again, it doesn't make sense. I would be afraid of him having a bad influence on guys like Dennis Smith Jr. and you know just other young Mavericks. They have a good locker room culture and I think he's the opposite of what they would need in that regard. But you never know because the Mavericks for some reason are really high on him. Reports were coming out even before the draft that they really believe, and we hear this every year, they really believe they can go get Boogie Cousins. And maybe they can, but to me, that's a mistake. You might be able to take a very big step forward if you get Boogie Cousins, but I think if you keep on the path you're going in terms of your rebuild, you can take ultimately more steps, even if the first step or two isn't as big if you go with a different route, which is one of these other guys I'm going to get to in a soon. Ha, huh, foreshadowing. Now let's take a look at another guy. This is my pie in the sky would be jumping out of my seat excited if the Mavericks pulled this off. This is the dude I think best fits what the Mavericks want and need moving forward. Although, it's gonna be a little tough to get him. That said, I think you offer his team, which you've done this before, you offer a poison pill contract. And while they're concerned with their other free agent ventures, you steal away Clint Capella of the Houston Rockets. Now, I mentioned a poison pill contract, and maybe you're wondering what that means. That is what the Mavericks did a few years ago with Chandler Parsons. I know, it's so crazy how many times I've had to mention Chandler Parsons lately. But, for years now, the Rockets have been determined to land big fish to pair with their team, trying to find more superstars to pair with James Harden. And to be fair, they've done a pretty good job of doing that. But as was the case a few years ago, the Mavericks, seeing Chandler Parsons hitting restricted free agency, offered him a huge contract which would create financial issues for the Rockets with their free agency spending. As a result, the Rockets weighed the options, and I actually think they found a better, I think they found an improvement, and not just an hindsight improvement. I think even at the time, it was probably an improvement for them to take Trevor Ariza as opposed to matching the offer for Chandler Parsons. But all the same, keeping Parsons and then trying to still do what they did in the rest of free agency, I don't think that was really a practical move for them. And as such, they let him go to Dallas. I'm not getting into the whole Parsons saga in Dallas again, but this is the same situation it would be for Clint Capella. Now let me run through his stats. 74 games last year, 74 starts. 27 and a half minutes a game, 65% from the field. Now he does have a weakness in his game a little bit. Uh, free throw shooting, not a good free throw shooter at any point in his career, but last season a little better than his overall career percentage. 56% last year. 10.8 rebounds a game, 13.9 points, and nearly two blocks a game, 1.9 blocks per game. This guy is 24 years old. This will be his first big payday. He is a rim protector. He is an offensive weapon. He is a solid rebounder. He makes a world of sense at 24 years old to pair with Dennis Smith Jr., Luka Doncic, and Jalen Brunson. Now, yeah, you could throw in Harrison Barnes in that as well, but again, I, I kind of view Harrison Barnes as a borderline stopgap. I know the Mavericks disagree. They view him as the Michael Finley to Dennis Smith and Doncic's Nash and Dirk kind of thing. And if that's the case, then maybe Barnes can hang around three more years or so. But all the same, I really think that Clint Capella is the perfect thing. Now, here's the problem. You're going to have to spend big to get him. They got the cap space. They can do it. But by going after a restricted free agent, 
you're tying yourself up. Now, after the whole DeAndre Jordan debacle in 2015, it has shortened up the period of time from which a team commits to a player. So if the Mavericks offer a max contract to Clint Capella, the Rockets used to would have had a week. That's what happened in the DeAndre Jordan fiasco. Now I think it's down to three or four days and you're tying up your money. You are verbally tied to that money. So the Rockets, depending on what they wanna do, they're gonna wait until the end of that window before they decide what they're going to do because it basically says, okay, you're trying to take away one of our better players. We're going to screw you over by putting you in a holding pen financially while other free agents that you might be interested in as backups continue to fall off of the market. But with Houston set to go full bore reportedly after LeBron James, Clint Capella will be a tough guy to hang on to. I mean, even if the Mavericks aren't the ones to throw money at him, someone's going to throw money at him. Before the draft, we were hearing that Phoenix was going to do it. I don't really think that's a good fit anymore because now they have DeAndre Ayton, but I could really see someone putting Houston in a holding pattern. And I would love for the Mavericks to do it, but it does come with certain risks. That means it could backfire. And if that's the case, I've made a huge mistake. Next up, we got a familiar face. He's already been referenced. And I think there's more validity to this one than we necessarily want to believe. I'm not even going to be super suspenseful on this one. I'm going to roll them out now. It's DeAndre Jordan. Yes, believe it or not, DeAndre Jordan could be coming to Dallas after all. And ironically, on the last year of the deal, we tried to give him. How just bizarre is that? Now, here's the reason why you do it if you're the Mavs. As I mentioned, DeAndre Jordan is in the last year of his contract. He would be a stopgap for the Mavericks. If they are serious, and they've given every indication and even said it, they are serious about competing now. They want back in the playoffs now. Fine. Your two biggest deficiencies, rebounding and rim protection. DeAndre Jordan brings both of those things. You're paying him big money for the last year of his contract, but then you can figure it out next year if you want to do something different. Last season for the Clippers, DeAndre Jordan had 77 games, 77 starts, 31 and a half minutes per game, 64 and a half percent from the field. Again, a bad free throw shooter, 58% from the charity stripe. Rebounds, 15.2 a game. The dude gets boards. And that's why we tried to get him last time around in 2015. Points a game, 12. That's nice. You give me a double-double option of 12 and 15, and you're telling me I only have to worry about the guy because of personal stuff for like a year? Great, sign me up, I'll take that. Now here's where he has dipped off a little bit since 2015. He averaged just under a block per game. That's actually a surprising thing for me because with his athleticism and everything, I really thought that that number would still hold around one and a half. Some of these other guys on the list like Clint Capella to a game. I mean, it's a little surprising to see the drop off, frankly, but I don't think it's end of the world. For the Mavericks and the fans, it's really about putting 2015 behind us and it's going to be awkward and not fun to do that to have to like be like oh god you want us to actually cheer this guy and like maybe even buy his jersey like i don't know about that man and that's fair totally fair what he did was lousy it was a cowardly thing not just that he changed his mind but how he went about it you know ghosting cuban and parsons and all that but man, you, you do what's best for the team here. And if he's a short-term plug-in for a season and then figure it out next year when you got more cap room again, fine. He'll make you better right now. And it's a short-term thing. Now, if we're talking about a deal before July 1st, the Mavericks are pretty much the only team who can make that deal right now. They have the cap room they could take them on right now. If you're waiting until July 1st, which is the soonest you can then start making significant moves to open up roster space, then you'll get a few more teams to open up like uh, Milwaukee. The Lakers could be a factor because we know at the trade deadline last year, LeBron really wanted Cleveland to go get DeAndre. And pretty much when they said, well, does that mean you're going to commit longer to us coming back? LeBron's like, no, I'm not promising that yet. To which Cleveland said, well, dude, we're not going to take on 
DeAndre and have you walk out on us and then we just have DeAndre. So I could see if the Lakers are really trying to pull off the LeBron deal. And, and by the way, in this hypothetical, this is assuming that Paul George doesn't go with LeBron to LA. Like if for some reason Paul George decides to stay put in OKC, there's a lot of momentum lately suggesting that he is now looking at a two-year deal with player option after one year. If that's the case, I don't know why exactly he would do that, but if he does do that, then maybe the Lakers say, okay, we'll, we'll get you DeAndre, we can do that. And so you get LeBron and DeAndre as well. I don't know, but it's another option for the Mavericks. I think this one is probably the most viable out of the options on this list, even if there's a lot of bad blood there. Next up, we have an interesting choice. This is a pick that I was actually interested in, and I made reference to it in the show the other night with Any when we graded the draft and talked a little bit on free agency. This guy's numbers won't blow you away, but he was the fifth overall pick recently. He's just 25 years old. You might already know where I'm going with this, who I'm talking about. So I'll just cut to the chase. I am talking about Alex Lynn, previously of the Phoenix Suns. Now Lynn, he's another one of those guys that's a little bit of a project, right? He's been with a bunch of bad Suns teams, but he is a seven foot one center who can spread the floor a little bit and he does have the physical tools to make him appealing. Now, is he a better suited to be your reserve center? Absolutely. But this is another guy that I think you could get if you're Dallas without throwing big money and could give you a nice prospect moving forward with your core of Doncic, Smith Jr., and Harrison Barnes, who the Mavericks still lump into that foundation of the future. So let's look at his stats. 69 games last year with 13 starts, just over 20 minutes a game, 56.6% from the field, I like that, 68% free throw shooter, that could be bumped up a little bit, 7.5 boards a game, 8.5 points a game, and just under one block a game at .9 blocks a game, same as DeAndre Jordan. Now, this one, like I said, Alex Lynn is not my first choice, but he is a conservative choice that I think still moves you forward. Nerlens Noel, I don't see much future foundation building with him. I don't want that option, really. That's just worth mentioning. But the point is, Nerlens Noel is not what I want. I want Clint Capella, but a consolation prize I would be at least lukewarm on, maybe even tepidly warm on, would be Alex Lynn because of his prospect factor as well and the belief in what better playmakers and a much better head coach could provide him. Now let's get into another guy that gets a lot of buzz around here. I myself have stoked those flames a little bit, admittedly. Another guy the Mavericks would really like who has kicked our butt in recent years. This guy only comes available if the Lakers have to start doing some wheeling and dealing to clear the way for LeBron James. That guy, of course... Julius Randle. Now here's why I like Julius Randle. He is a fine young talent. 82 games last year, so played in every game. 49 starts, that's a little surprising. 26 and a half minutes a game, a little over 26 and a half minutes a game. 55.8% from the field, 71, nearly 72% at the free throw line. Eight boards, 16 points, and half a block a game. Now as far as rim protection, he is a little bit on the downside as far as these other prospects I'm detailing here. In fact, I would say he clearly has the fewest blocks per game of anyone on this list. When he's played the Mavericks in recent years, he has torn them up. Games like 23 points, 15 boards, he has been a huge thorn in the Mavericks side the past couple of years when they play the Lakers. But for some reason, the Mavericks don't appear all that high on him. The other day, Mike Fisher of 105.3 The Fan was talking about how there wasn't a ton of interest in Julius Randle because he didn't fit what they wanted to do. To me, that's an interesting statement because where we are in the rebuild, you would say you don't want a guy that is young and can put up solid averages, you know, double-double territory. 
I think what they're referring to is he's a little bit more of a traditional back to the basket kind of guy. He can spread the floor a little bit, but he's best at operating off a low block. And I don't think the Mavericks are looking necessarily for that type of post presence, given the way the game is moving forward these days. Again, this is a guy I've been pretty high on for the past year, thinking the Mavericks could really get him. In fact, I think one of the most read articles on the DallasProspect.com is one in which I talked about specifically they should have traded for him at the deadline last year. And the explanation that I got at the time for why they didn't or why they weren't thinking it was because like, hey, why give up assets for him now if you know the Lakers are going to try and spend big in the summer and you can get him just at a new contract and you don't have to give up assets. Made sense to me given the state of the Mavericks at the time. He has ties to Dallas as well, I believe. And that's just not how it worked out. And it sounds like they're not super interested in that. So I'm a little surprised by it, but all the same, as long as they do something, as long as they keep this youth movement going, or at least find a suitable stopgap, then I'll, I'll trust in the process. Now here's an interesting option coming up next, and this is where we start getting into more difficult territory. This is again talking in the realm of restricted free agents. This deal would be with the Portland Trailblazers, and it would require them to basically look at what happened last year. The Blazers were the three seed in the Western Conference last year. Very surprisingly good team last year. And it requires that they, despite being the three seed, and they got swept by a six seed in the first round of the playoffs, without DeMarcus Cousins, mind you, it requires that because of how over the luxury tax they are, that they would basically be willing to part with one of their better players in the sake of a rebuild. This would be for, holy crap, I'm going to botch this name, uh, Yusef Nurkic. I, I feel fairly confident in the Nurkic part. So let's take a look at his stats. 79 games, 79 starts. 26 minutes per game, 50% from the field, 63% from the charity stripe, 9 boards, 14 points, and 1.5 and blocks per game. That is what I like to see. Now, his numbers don't jump off the board with regard to outside game, but he does give you rebounding and he does give you points production. And if a guy like DeAndre Jordan is being discussed as a, hey, he's going into the last year of his deal, you'd have to do some kind of trade to acquire him, maybe this one could work. And DeAndre Jordan damn sure doesn't have any kind of outside game, so I'm going to go out on a limb and say this would be an upgrade with greater potential for long-term team building. This is going to be Nurkic's sixth NBA season you can still get him at a very good deal. His base salary this season is $4.75 million. Now his cap hit is $8.8 .8 million approximately, but we're still talking about a situation wherein you can get a very good young center with the defensive presence and good rebounding, not great rebounding, but good rebounding to help your young team. I like that. I just don't think that Portland, given they were the three seed, yes, they got railroaded by the New Orleans Pelicans and specifically Anthony Davis last year. But Anthony Davis was playing out of his mind in the playoffs last year. Pretty much after Boogie went down, he just put the entire team on his back and just carried them. That was MVP caliber work from Anthony Davis last year. So that... And the fact that it was a bad matchup for Portland, I think, keeps them from making any move for him. I don't think they're going to move Nurkic because of that. And even if they did have to shuffle the team around a little bit, I don't think he's the guy that's on the cutting room floor, so to speak. So yes, nice player, but I don't see that being the long-term option for the Mavericks because I don't see Portland being willing to part with him. But we'll see. Now let's take a look at another interesting center. This is another interesting prospect. And considering who this team just drafted, he could find himself actually available here soon. I'm talking, of course, about Nikola Vucevic. Vucevic. Well, 
These names kill me, man. 57 games last year, 57 starts, a shade under 30 minutes a game, 47.5% from the field, 82% at the line, 9 boards, 16.5 points, more than a block a game. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Give me that. Now, he is slated to make $12.75 million this coming season. So, the only real reason I think they could maybe move him, and I don't really understand it if they do, but they did just draft Mo Bamba at 6th overall, I believe. So, he is a little bit expendable now to them, whereas before I would have said, why would you ever consider getting rid of a guy like that? But... I don't know. I, I think for a year or two, it makes sense. At least the rest of this year, right? Run him out on the rest of this contract. Let him play with Bamba. Kind of mentor him a little bit. And I think you get a better product. But I don't know what the thinking is of the Magic front office. Perhaps they do look to move him while they can get assets for him. And if that's the case, Dallas should definitely pick up the phone and at least get an idea of what the price would be. So those are eight options for the Dallas Mavericks at the center position in free agency. Now, to be clear, or fair I should say, or technically correct one might presume, it's not all free agency. It's free agents, restricted free agents, and a couple trade scenarios wherein you're trying to acquire a guy in the last year of his deal. Of these options, you're trying to find the most practical guys. I don't think Julius Randle really fits with what they're wanting to do. I don't think Nerland's Noel makes any sense at all. Alex Lynn would be nice, but he is a little bit of a consolation prize. Nurkic and Vujicic both are nice, but neither one is going to be easily acquired, I don't think. I really think the most practical path for the Mavericks is going to be DeAndre Jordan, even though I'm not thrilled to say that. If DeAndre Jordan is the best you can do, fine. You're not going to excite me too much. It's going to be really awkward for a while. But if he's here, he's working hard, and he seems like he's happy to be here, maybe Maverick fans can get over 2015. We'll see in that regard. That said, I really think that Clint Capella is the best option for Dallas. I just don't think he's the easiest to get. If you could steal him away... I think that is I think that is an acquisition not necessarily on the level of what adding Dennis Smith or Luka Doncic was, but it's up there. It is easily one of your biggest acquisitions and I think changes the trajectory of your franchise. I'm not even kidding. I am that high on Clint Capella and I think he will be a huge addition if they can pull the trigger a lot of that takes courage the Mavericks they've been courageous in the past but now that you've built up a little something in terms of roster pieces that you think could be really good it gets a little harder to be that bold now if they weren't so committed to immediately competing and being back in the playoffs now I would say be bold say hey we want to be back in the playoffs but we're going to play it out go for Clint Capella if you don't get him, and if you lose out on other guys that you might like as well, like the DeAndre Jordan deal for a stopgap, or like an Alex Lynn for another kind of mid-level prospect, all right, well, you know, keep your powder dry, right, Mark? But that's all my time for this video, guys. If you like this, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Don't forget to check out the website, thedallasprospect.com, your home for Dallas sports and all things pop culture. Buy the shirts. Support us on Patreon if you want to help us put out more frequent content, better content, hire more contributors, and really diversify what we're able to do here. Anything helps. Anything is appreciated. And stay tuned, guys. we got a lot of great content coming out here soon. We're looking to add several new shows to the weekly lineup, and we got a lot of great stuff coming your way. And remember, guys, every legend was once a prospect.